Well, thanks for coming. I know that first day is very exciting, a lot of news, a lot of things. Uh, who's here your first time at KubeCon? Can you raise your hand? Oh, really? Wow. And Fluent Bit users? Cool, wow. half for half. Let's get 80% <laughs> end of this year. Well, my name is Eduardo Silva, and together with uh, Anurag Gupta, who's also my tenor of Fluent Bit, uh, we are really happy about this announcement. I know that you see this some kind of news this morning. And the, the goal of this session is to give you a very quick intro to the project because we don't have so much time, a quick update about what's going on, and a quick demo if we have enough time for that. So we represent ourselves. You can follow us on GitHub, Twitter, and well, first of all, one-on-one, -on -one, right? So Fluentbit is part of the FluentD uh, family project and both solve one of the problems that is move data from one place to the other. That's basically how it started, right? But in the middle, we can do processing, data reduction, and a bunch of things that maybe you are already aware of. Both projects are graduated with a CNCF, right? So a few projects are in that state for now. And as its name is called Fluent, it's aimed to be a fluent ecosystem. Has never the intent of FluentD in the beginning or FluentBit be just the only solution that runs in your environment, right? Actually, uh, in the beginnings with FluentD, part of the story, we even integrate with other projects that are kind of competitors in the same space, right? Because the value is that the final, the end user, who are you, right, can choose between one solution or the other based on your own specific use cases. Okay, but moving forward, I think that when Fluentbit, we have followed the same pattern, right? No matter what is coming out in the, in the industry, if there's a new standard, we are going to jump and support it. Why? Because the users need it, right? And yeah, and that's how we are happy to the project a lot with different uh, type of uh, integrations. And Fluent is all about open source, but observability. And that is really important, is to provide the avoiding the vendor locking for users, right? It's normal that when you go and you buy a solution, because your goal is not to deploy an agent, right? Nobody likes deploying an agent besides me. But besides that, right, you choose a Splunk, you choose Elastic, whatever you want. But at some point after one year, two years, or in the middle, you just want to use one backend and maybe switch to another, and to gain more control over your data. And that's what we call the vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in is when the vendor that you're paying for services locks you in into their own solution, and it will be very complex for you to get out of it. Sometimes it takes more than a year, right? So the whole thing about Fluent and many other projects in the ecosystem is about give you this freedom and flexibility to say, okay, today I'm using this vendor, but since I use this project like Fluent, I can decide where my data will go, okay? And it's project and product platform agnostic. Who use this? Well, um, if you go to GKG, Google Cloud, the project Kubernetes cluster, or you go to EKS on Amazon, you will see that Fluentbit is running by default in there. There are millions and millions of deployments of Fluentbit every single day. And where are we going? Everything started with FluentD, and we are from the same family. But FluentD was really hard to, to make it scale even more from what it was doing at the moment. Most of it, the major technical challenge that's written in Ruby is very flexible, it's very powerful, there's a thousand plugins in the market, but when it's about to distribute the systems and be able to scale at a very high rate because companies and users are having almost 35% more data every year, you know, the agent is one side that is not scaling enough, right? And that's what one of the reasons why Fluentbit was born. Well, originally for embedded Linux, but then started evolving as a cloud native solution. And we, we are part of the same family, same project, and we say that most of the innovation is happening now in Fluentbit. And one of the trends is that cloud providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, has migrated from FluentD to FluentBit. In the highlights, in, well, production grade is really high performance, 
Maybe you don't know, but Fluent Beat is written in C language. Yeah. Unsafe memory. Yeah, you can say all of that. But it runs and it scales. And that is the, the good thing. You can develop on any language. So in any language, you can do things slow or fast, right? Or buggy, right? The thing is that if you have the best practices to avoid situations like uh, memory corruptions or, you know, um, having not free memory when it needs to be done. Yeah, if you put all the best practices, you will be fine. And I think in the project, over the years, we have learned about all these practices. And there's a team, there are cloud providers contributing to the project. So every year it gets more strong. And of course, low resource consumption. Everybody, when develop applications now, nobody thinks about memory. And I think that that is a bad practice. Well, I'm a kind of old school. And in old school, I think about memory, how much memory this component is going to use. And maybe I can reuse this a bunch of memory before trying it out to release it and reallocate it again. This kind of optimization exists in FluentBit. And FluentBit can be uh, retrieved and consumed from different places. Uh, you can use, of course, feel, follow the upstream releases. FluentBit upstream, a new, a new minor version is released every two weeks. Right? But if you want to run in a more long-term, stable way, there are distributions of FluentBit that are based on up upstream, but uh, they are supported, like the AWS for FluentBit, uh, Calitia for FluentBit, and Google Ops Agent, which Google uses for their own customers. And you can get the container images, packages for Debian, Red Hat, Rocket Linux, or any kind of new fancy distribution around. Even CentOS 6, I think. You will not imagine how many people are running CentOS 6. Okay, so FluentBit, as I said at the beginning, it's all about to move data from one place to the other. And you will think that uh, the concepts that we have are sources or inputs, and in the other side are destinations. How FluentBit connects everything is about the concept of plugins. So internally, we implement a plugin to understand, for example, uh, metadata from Kubernetes how to scrape data from Prometheus, how to receive data from applications, sending open telemetry data, or just metrics from the Linux system that is running. So it's very versatile and flexible to get data locally or remotely. And the same concept applies for the output side. What I didn't mention here is about the filters. So in the middle, you can do filtering, which means a capacity is to modify the records or enrich your data or just drop data that follows a pattern that you are not interested in. And where we are today, this is crazy. And, and I say crazy because in, when you start a project and you start getting a, a few Docker Hub pools, right? Well, this is started on 2016, right? This, but we just started the container on 2019. And you see that during this year, we are getting more than 2 billion downloads. That's a lot. And what that means is a lot of responsibility for the maintainers and companies that contribute. But also, you get more enhancement requests. You get more bug requests. Hey, we have more bugs because you found a many other kind of uh, use cases. So the trend is like this year, everything is going up. and. I, I don't know, in total, it's more than 3 billion. CNCF just did a blog post about that. And well, we're really happy about this, but it's a huge responsibility. So I'm sure that everybody who's here will contribute to the project also to make it more healthy. In general investments, uh, in this year, we have done all the telemetry signal support. Fluentbit was originally just done for to support logs, but then we expanded to support metrics and support traces, right? That means that we support the native payloads. We added TLS, TLS support for the input plugins. That means that you can use FluentBit now securely as a collector or an aggregator, meaning a software that sits in the middle and can receive data over the network securely. We have a new cool feature called TAP, T-A-P. That solved one of the problems that many users had. They said, FluentBit is working. I'm seeing my data, but sometimes the format of my data is not as I was expecting after I query Elastic or after I query Splunk. So they said the only way to troubleshoot that, that sorry, is to stop FluentBit, right, and try an STD out plugin and try to dig what is going on. 
and then I can start it again on start and, and you know they got into that cycle so tap is a feature that now if you enable of course over an HTTP request you can tell Fluentbit hey open for me a tap session and send me in a couple of seconds the data that is flowing through this input plugin just send me some samples and then that session gets destroyed so you can inspect what's going on you know uh, internally of course you're not going to enable tap to the public internet it will run inside your cluster securely right but it is that up to you how you handle it and all the requirements that we got is like um Fluembed has a, like a storage engine it's not like a database but it allows you to store data either in memory either in file system depending on how you want to handle the load and Fluembed internal metrics did not expose the storage metrics now you can flow those metrics as part of the pipeline for example you can ship fluent bit metrics through a prometheus remote write endpoint or open telemetry metrics okay so logs metrics and traces this is all about this release and logs has been there since the beginning we support unstructured data structured is schemaless and we support processing like filtering and enrichment of data you have seen this from the beginning. From the metrics side, we, we support the standards of open metrics and open telemetry, right? All of this is about a defined schema, and we support different uh, metrics types like counter gauges, histograms, summaries, whatever you have right now. And the good thing is that when we say support metrics, not just Prometheus and open telemetry, at the moment that Fluentbit gets metrics inside, we can even send those metrics to Splunk. We can send those metrics to InfluxDB, right? So this is one of the values of this implementation that keeps being agnostic and be able to, it, it provides you with flexibility to connect to different endpoints and endpoint types. In the Prometheus side, we try to replicate and integrate different specific features. For example, I don't know if you're familiar with node exported metrics, which is a project from Prometheus. Uh, in conversation with the team, we come up with the idea, hey, why we don't implement the same functionality but inside Fluentbit? So Fluentbit now has a plugin called Node Exported Metrics that generate the same metrics that that tool that Prometheus does. So many people who was running Fluentbit and Prometheus Node Exported Metrics, now just can do the same with Fluentbit. So they just had one less agent to manage. We can scrape Prometheus endpoints and also we can expose that metrics data by using the Prometheus exported protocol or the Prometheus A remote write. In open telemetry, today we are announcing with Fluent B2 that all support for logs, metrics, and traces. Fully supported. I know you will have a lot of questions at the end, so we'll be happy to answer all of that. And if we don't have enough time here, we can go to the hall and fight there. Okay, performance improvements. Uh, one of the also the challenges is like, you know, 35% more data every year. I'm tailing files, but I now have more load. And Fluentbit from the beginning was running just in a single process mode, but it was really efficient. But year over year, people say, hey, you know, I have like 96 core in my machine, and you're using one. Good enough. Okay, we implemented threading for the output plugins. So now when the output plugins are doing processing or encoding the data, all of that happens in separate CPU cores. Now we did the same for input plugins, but you have to enable that feature. Okay? So you can tell to tail, hey, just run in threaded mode, and that old tail will do run in a separate uh, CPU core. And there's a bunch of performance optimizations like reduced memory allocation, we do a better handling for data encoding and so on. For us, performance is always first with security, of course, and we try to you know go up year after year. And for who's a developer, and you say, oh, why Fluentbit and developers? Not for who develop Fluentbit, but if you're in a company, one of the trends is that companies want to bring the business logic into the data pipeline. Meaning like, if some data contains a pattern where there's a credit card transaction number or any kind of sensitive data, you might want to mask that information or there's any social security number and you want to perform some action if that data comes in. In Fluentbit, as of yesterday, we provided Lua filters 
so filters with a Lua scripting language that you can write your own um, your own rules and take some decisions on that. And today we are expanding that with WebAssembly. If you're not familiar with WebAssembly, it's like a new trending thing that allows you to write a code in many languages like Rust or C++ or Python and generate some kind of bytecode, like a unique specification that can run in Fluentbit. So you are not longer restricted to C, you are not that longer restricted to Lua. You can write in your own language. And that applies for input plugins and filters. And for Golang, now we support the Golang to write output plugins in Golang. Now you can write your input plugins in Golang too. Okay, I'm going to pass the microphone to Anurag. You want to connect your computer? Yeah, I'll plug in my computer. So hey everyone, uh, what I'm going to do is show a demo of all of these things kind of in practice here. As I load this up. What the architecture... Looks like the other microphone is not using. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what we're going to do is show you an architecture of how this all works together with FluentBit uh, 2.0. We're also going to show Jaeger, Grafana for visualization, uh, and then all of this running uh, trace application underneath. So an application is generating a lot of good open telemetry data, great schema, firing off that data. We're collecting it with FluentBit, and we're firing it off to the OpenTelemetry collector, and we're firing it off to uh, Jaeger as well. So if I go ahead, I can just show you the Docker desktop that's running here. And this just shows you the containers and apps I have. All of this is open source, by the way, so you can try it out here uh, as well. You'll see our FluentBit uh, demo app. We have FluentBit. That's now running the 2.0 version. Jaeger, Prometheus, uh, the collector, Grafana, and uh, Vivo, just so we can quickly visualize uh, the data. So if I go ahead and go into a Grafana dashboard, you know the same experience that you might be used to and, and be using, we're having FluentBit firing off this data from a metric side over to Prometheus. And here we are collecting those metrics and, and visualizing it with, with the dashboard. So what does that really start to enable is we don't want to have you continue switching all these tools. Why can't we just plug into all of the ecosystems, workflows, tools, and open source standards that you might already have in place? The next is uh, with the Jaeger side. We're just firing it off to Jaeger with all the open telemetry support that awesome team has been, been adding over there. Uh, we can quickly go ahead and take that same service, look at the spans. Again, this is a really simple, I think it's a JavaScript um, thing that's firing off uh, telemetry spans over, over time. Now, this, is, uh, this feature set is uh, something where we've tried really hard also to make sure that the experience of setting it up doesn't mean that you have to have intense knowledge about the underlying protocols and how everything works. You really just set a port up, and from there, depending on the data type that was being fired, we're able to grab that, take it for an internal conversion, and then fire it off to the expected output, whether it's Prometheus, Otel, Jaeger, etc. Now, the last thing I want to show is uh, one of the, the kind of top features that have always been requested from our side of, hey, I'm running this on thousands and thousands of servers. I'm not sure what's happening. Data's not flowing. How can I go and make sure that the data that's being sent is, is correct? And this is a feature we call TAP. Now, TAP, I'm going to go ahead and open up my terminal here. And in the terminal, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, increase the font size here. How's that look? Awesome. OK. And then what we're going to do is run FluentBit uh, v2 with this new option called dash z. Uh, now, what dash z is going to do is it's going to allow us to make an HTTP request to the running FluentBit to say, hey, FluentBit, what's going on? at this particular plugin. I don't know what's happening. Something's not functioning correctly. I want to start to debug and understand what's, what's happening. Now, if we go into this other tab to go ahead and make a request, 
we can run a pretty simple curl command. And the plugin I'm running is called dummy. It just generates, as you saw, a message dummy every single second. I'm gonna run this command. It's gonna say, okay, FluentBit says, okay, I've been instructed to now go and instrument all of those uh, specific dummy filter plugins. Now, say you have 100 filters. You can actually choose the very specific filter or plugin that you wanna go instrument and enable, and then we will, on the other screen, we'll print out uh, all of those, all of that information for you so you can see the exact payload uh, that is there. All right, so you have to enable this, so it's not like this is enabled by default and anyone can access anything in, in your pipeline. Two, there are limitations or uh, settings you can put in with how big a payload you want for a specific amount of time, uh, and, and really quickly start to look at this information coming in live and say, ah, that's why I got a HTTP 400 error, that's why my filter is not showing up. Uh, a little bit easier to do things live, which I always am surprised with, right? Debug in, in production. Uh, and then last but not least, just kind of on the visualization side, you know, if we want to, you know, look at what's happening, you can fire it off to, say, a, a live data viewer. And this is uh, one, of, one of the open source projects where you just dump data in, you can start to visualize it. So with that, it's a kind of overview of FluentBit v2, architecture of how we send data to uh, all of the different open telemetry sources, logs, metrics, traces. We showed a little bit about TAP for more operational debugging. Uh, with that, I think we'll have plenty of time here for additional questions. But yeah, thank you so much. Hi. I have FluentD. It is running well, no issues. Can you convince me to switch to FluentBit? If it works, don't fix it. Yeah. I, I think that's also, yeah, it's, it's a very good, good question. If I'm running something, no challenges, what's the purpose of migrating if you're not getting but, incredible? But, um, whether I should start considering it sometimes in the future when scale is higher or where, where is this line where we should start thinking about? Is it about performance when yeah. FluentD starts to fail due to high, uh, high, high volume? Or? I think three, three considerations. Scale for sure. When running on Kubernetes, container density goes up, more logs, maybe network devices, security devices generating more traffic. Great, that's one consideration when you, want, you might want to switch. Two is if you want to do some more of those enrichments, redactions, things with uh, Wasm or Lua. There's a lot of inbuilt functionality there for like shying and stuff like that. And, and last but not least is you start to have constraints with resources. Like uh, maybe your environment shrinks or things become a little noisy. Having that capability, those are, those are the three draws that we typically see. But if it works right now and none of those things are hitting you, yeah, kind of just keep it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we are running Fluent D, not Fluent Bit yet. Okay. Uh, and like you said, no need to upgrade. Uh, I've seen like you you are sending logs to um, um, Prometheus as well from Fluent Bit. Right now, we are running a Node exporter, um, and I think it's a Prometheus black box. So what's an advantage of using Fluent Bit instead of using just the Prometheus Node exporter and the black box? Great, great question. For, I'll, I'll say that almost the same, almost same answer. If it's working with Node Exporter, no reason to, to switch it out. What we find is sometimes folks will say, I want to capture host level metrics, but I don't want to run a Node Exporter. And that was the main draw of uh, folks who were saying, hey, I'd love to scrape the data. I don't want to have to install another or manage multiple agents. Right? Managing agents is, is not the, the fun thing of, of anyone's uh, role. So if, if that's something we can enable and you get value from it, awesome. But if you have Node Exporter there, great. That's that's a big win too. Something to add on Node Exporter in general is a great project, but we found that many users, for example, has a cluster like a hundred nodes, and if Node Exporter is using 15 megabytes, 20 megabytes, multiplied by the amount of you know nodes, sometimes they say, hey, I don't want to waste that amount of memory from a cluster perspective versus some kilobytes in Fluentbit 
for the same functionality. That's one of the so trade offs. for both the Splunk as well as for uh, Prometheus? Or do we have yeah. to run two set of uh, things? Yeah. So users ask to, to run Fluent Bit where all the applications sit. And it's a good challenge for us because it pushes us to you know, make it more lightweight and so on. So yeah, we'll so say, yeah. Same daemon set, just add the Prometheus config, try it out. It's, yep. Okay, and it will, it will extract the logs, format, and all. all exactly, stuff. you don't yeah. have to do any additional Fluent Bit instances. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, you mentioned you added uh, um, two languages support uh, WA and Golang. I'm not very familiar with the, the WA, but I'm a, a, a Golang um, a, 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 a developer. So uh, I'm wondering that what dependencies, uh, dependent packages that uh, you natively support with Golang, can I add the dependent package? Uh, as I want, or what was the limitation of that uh, language support, uh, as well as with uh, WA? Good question. So if you're going to use, li so with Wasm and Go, if you're going to use specific libraries from either of those languages, you'll typically need those as a dependency, similar to like say Lua, we include the Lua JIT library, but if you're going to do some Lua XML or uh, some other library, you need to have those as part of the, the initial package. Uh, with Wasm and the Go input plugins, those are the, those are the same dependencies that, that we have with the package today. So it's not anything additional. I think the biggest additional dependency you'll have with Flimpit 2.0 is probably the YAML side. So we now have YAML-based configuration. Uh, so basically, if I understand uh, your answer correctly, then uh, you mean if I want uh, uh, another uh, dependent like package for Golang, then I have to have a Docker file, have those packages installed with, along with the Flume bit. Okay, okay, got right. it, thank you. Sure. The gentleman on the, on your right, yeah. He's uh, so just to follow up on his question as far as the node exporter uh, feature, does that does that have is it at parity with the the Prometheus node exporter or is there a subset and how where does that where does that line get yeah, drawn? Yeah, good good question. It's a subset today, so probably about eighty percent. So you could take that same exact uh, node exporter plugin, fire it to Prometheus, have that Grafana node exporter dashboard, and it'll probably fill out about eighty percent of the metrics. Do you guys have the 20% on the on your doc somewhere that isn't there? Yeah, there's there's a couple of GitHub issues. So folks in the community say, hey, we really want file system with this specific uh, metric that we've, we've skipped over. Okay, great. But I think those are the things that we're really looking for from the community also to say, hey, look, we want X, Y, Z. Here's also what we want, Windows metrics, Windows Exporter. Uh, and that, that really helps to, for us to build out a robust roadmap. And then uh, you mentioned you guys have the Prometheus Remote Write API. Yep. Um, so could I, I could deploy, I could end up de basically deploying Fluent Bit and not have to maybe deploy a, a local Prometheus cluster on my. Yeah, cluster you could. Cluster? One typical use case is a lot of hosted providers have Prometheus Remote Write endpoints. Mm -hmm. So you just fire off the, the data over there. Awesome. Thank you. One other use case that came up is with all these open telemetry thing. Some users said, hey, I'm using this X provider or vendors with an open telemetry endpoint, but I want to collect my metrics with node exporter, right? With node exporter alone, you cannot do it because you might need the Prometheus node exporter plus open telemetry, telemetry collector to do some processing and send it out. But if you have Fluent Bed, you just can do node exported style locally and fire off the data to open telemetry metrics directly. Hi, um, one of our lead engineers is very frustrated by how far AWS Firelands is behind um, uh, uh, the current Fluent Bit. Um, do you have any insights into that? Do you know, have any uh, knowledge of, of, of how long that's gonna take for them to catch up? 
Ooh, I, I wish. Uh, no, we, we have, we don't have any insights to that. There is a AWS Fluent Bit maintainer, um, so that might be something uh, worth, worth talking to. Yeah, we're trying to ship every two weeks, put as many cool features as we can. Um, so that's, unfortunately, yeah, I don't have any visibility into that. But we will pass the message. Yeah. Uh, one more over there. Hey, uh, so currently we have a log stash to scrape the metrics, uh, scrape the Kafka event, and we send it to uh, OpenSearch and Elasticsearch. Do you foresee or do you have any, uh, I mean, do you think the FluentBit can support that kind of uh, even scraping from Kafka and send it to any of our log, any of the logging solutions. Yeah, good, good question. We've had a Kafka input issue for for a while. We actually did a small POC with the with the single threaded input model, and it was a bit slow um, for for what we feel comfortable with. Uh, with the new input threaded interface in V2, we can perform that at a much much higher and, and faster cadence. So. Uh, we actually, for Kafka, we use already Kafka out on, on the output side, and that works really, really well. There's a good presentation um, by uh, LinkedIn on Monday at Open Observability Day. I think those sessions should be up about the Kafka output. Uh, for the input, yes, it's, it's, we've unlocked the pieces to make it, make it so. Sorry, I just remembered my other question. Sure. Um, uh, on the tap functionality, uh, uh, Enabling that to be a command line argument, and then it's over HTTP, correct? That is correct. So there, there's two ways to enable via command line. You can also enable it in the container uh, via service level parameter. Okay. Um, and then to enable the actual tracing functionality, it's an HTTP request. And then can I provide it an SSL cert, or is that not a capability it has? I, I think for now, the NTLS side is limited to input plugins, but that is something where they do borrow the same interface so we can put it on top too. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Okay, I think we're right out of time, but of course we'll be out in the hall if you have something more in depth. Uh, you wanna complain about any other vendors, we'll take it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.